And this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, Leaf Tulin will share his updated mock draft for the 2023 NBA draft. Let's see if he has some surprises. Stay tuned. All right, first of all, I'd like to thank each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I am your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies. And my co-host, Leif Tulane, is the man that watches more college basketball than anyone else. And Leif, you are dropping off your latest big board today. First of all, how's everything going your way? And then when you put this big board together... How much of it was based off of recent play or just the, the overall play for the entire season? Uh, I'm doing all right. A little cooped up with COVID right now. So that's let me live up to the title of watching more basketball than just about anyone around because that's what I've done the last four days. Just watch <laughs> basketball. <laughs> and it's kind, of, it's kind of been fun in a way, but I'm going crazy in the being inside my room. But uh, um, I'm other than that, I'm doing well. And to answer your question about whether it's holistic, I, I try to look at everything from a holistic view. Of course, there's recency bias for every one of us, and there's confir confirmation bias for like if we liked a guy coming out of high school, we, we may try to, but I try to be as objective as possible and I try to be as holistic as possible. Um, so yeah, this big board I put together yesterday. Um, and I, I kind of had been working on a top 20, and then I, I made up to about 45 spots. and and I, I definitely feel good about my top 20 from, from 20 to 30 is a, a log jam. I could spin it a million different ways. And, and beyond that, I was just kind of compiling names, I think, to be considered around that range. But uh, watching basketball is always fun. Wish it were under cer different circumstances. All right. Number one, any surprises there? No, no. Victor Wembanyama all the way. I mean, he's, he's generational, and that's a term that's become overused, but I mean it in the most sincere sense that he, you've never seen someone like this. He's regarded as the top prospect since LeBron or maybe even more more highly regarded because he's played professional basketball rather than high school basketball. And um, not, no surprise there for me. I, I, I'm still impressed. I watched his last game he played, and even without a crazy box score, he played against a true professional team, his former team, and, uh, and ones filled with French national team players and high-level athletes, and he was still – the crowning jewel on that basketball court yeah had a had a game winning dunk all right speaking of game winning plays i'm, I'm assuming your number two is scoot henderson and he has yeah, it had sure is he's had multiple game winning or game tying shots since he came since he's returned from the concussion or, or, or nasal industry all right nasal nasal injury it is late it is past midnight and we're recording, so forgive me for the, the errors. All right, so at number three and number four, yours is very similar to mine. You have uh, the Thompson twins, and I know why I have them three and four. I explain why, why you are higher on the Thompson twins than any of the college prospects. So coming into this year, I'll, I'll preface it with this. Coming into this year, I had Amon Thompson number three, so nothing's changed there for me. I still have Amon Thompson number three. And I had Osar around six, but we, which was pretty commonplace from what, what a lot of mocks had said and, and big boards had said. Um, and, and I, you know, I was told about Nick Smith and Cam Whitmore. And of course, they didn't play much coming in with different injuries. And then there was Keontae George and Brandon Miller certainly been impressive. But I just tr tried to trust my eyes. I, I don't know if how comparable their, the competition level is. But I thought about what traits make a good draft pick. And, and you know, the same traits that make Amon Thompson really awesome are, are the same for Osar. And, and I think if a team were to pick him, they could make him their point guard. Like the main concern is that like off ball, what does he present? Because he's not a great shooter. Well, he presents elite athleticism, great defense, an ability to put pressure on the rim, a good passer. And, and he doesn't show all the passing traits because he's playing a two guard. Um, and I think... I'm not sold on his shot. I don't want to act like I am, but I think shooting is the easiest tool to fix. And he's got a better looking jump shot than his brother. Um, and his brother like has been compared to a six, seven John Morant. So why not? And I'm not saying that's what it'll be necessarily. I'm just tossing out stuff that's been out there. And uh, so why not take someone who's just about as similar as you can make? And I know they're twins and I know there's differences, 
Um, but that's my logic. He's got as high a ceiling as anyone. I, I really think he's got extremely uh, other than the top two. And I think he's got as high a floor as just about anyone as well. Yeah, I, I agree. The shooting is concerning to me, especially when you consider Scoot has shown major strides as an improved shooter. And you can say the Thompson twins are, are pretty much the same as last year. As far as their competition, it's, you know, it's a younger, it's a younger group of guys, even though they had some games this summer where they played like in the, the basketball tournament and they played some teams overseas. To me, that's a little bit concerning. And then they're on the same team. So you have the two best players, you know, arguably two of the top five players in this draft playing on the same team in a league that is pretty young. So that's a little bit of a concern, but if you're, and you are thinking like me as far as just swinging for the fences and guys that probably have the, the highest upside, I agree with, with, with three and four. And not saying that if I disagree that it matters or not, because who am I? <laughs> but um, we, we're on the same page at our top four. All right, at number five, who was number five on your list? I've got Brandon Miller, number five. Uh, we talked before the season. And I was telling you he was kind of my freshman that I had an eye on because of, again, it was traits and, and size and positional size is really taking over the NBA right now. You think of a lot of the dynamic wing scores. They're tall guys you can create from different levels. And uh, we talked about uh, the issue for him entering the season was, man, like, does he rely on taking tough shots? Um, but and that was always something we we talked about with Van Caro and Jason Tatum. And I'm not uh, comparing those uh, two to him directly, but shot making is a skill. And the fact that he can make those means he can hit other shots. People are concerned his jump shots a little flat. It's not a bit extremely high arcing, but he's proven to be one of the better shooters in the country, much less as a freshman, doing it on a top four team on the country um, as their leading score, their best player. And he's able to score any wants. He scored 36 against Gonzaga against another NBA hopeful and Julian Strother. Um, I, I don't think he's faultless. I think he's played a few guys with, with elite athleticism, of, such as Andre Jackson, Leaky Black, and a few others that have made him have difficult games and he needs to get stronger around the rim. But I, I think he's got a higher ceiling than some of the guys that are coming up just behind him in this, in this big board. Yeah, I, I had him at number eight. And I even wrote down that I could be totally wrong and this could – be something I regret but this was you know it was January the first of January when I released this big board and I'm really starting to think that myself included people are just starting to nitpick too much and focus on what he's not the best at as opposed to what he does really really well and if you look at you know some of the past drafts we've seen guys that have been able to score at, at a high level in college and there was a lot of focus on, oh, he doesn't do this well. He doesn't do that well. And and, and two guys that kind of come to mind for me are Tatum and Ben Carroll. Not saying he is those guys, but like you said, the things that he does well, which is shoot the ball, should translate to the NBA. So number five, and like I said, I had him at number eight, but I openly admitted that that could be something I regret later on. All right, at number six, who's number six? I got Cam Whitmore, and this is this is one that's interesting to me because if you'd asked me which freshman was my top guy entering the season and even a month in before he'd played, I was blindly choosing to to trust Cam Whitmore, and I still do. Um, and now he now he's showing those flashes and he's getting into. I wouldn't say he was out of shape. I think he's just into the the Rusty. shape of of playing repetitions and he's shaking off the rust. That's exactly right, and. Uh, you're seeing the jump shots coming back, his explosiveness going to the rim. Uh, they kept harping about how incredible his first step was on the broadcast against uh, Xavier this weekend where Cam Whitmore was really the the shining light in another uh, Nova loss. Um, I, I think his his creation of space has, has not been awesome, but I, I just think he, I have a hard time seeing him fail in the NBA and he's got those elite traits and he's still shaking off the rust. So He's a guy that I'm, I remain bullish on, and I think I think his shooting splits will continue to get better, and I think you'll see these takeover moments that he's already displayed glimpses of and on a larger scale as again further into Big East play. All right, that is your top six, and when we return, we'll get seven through 14. But let's talk about prize picks. Prize picks is daily fantasy made easy. If you're not familiar with prize picks, all you have to do is pick two to six players, and if they would go score more or less than their prize picks projection, you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. There is no competing against other people. 
It is just you versus the projections available. Prize Picks offers projections on any sport that you watch. NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball, NHL, women and men's college basketball, soccer, esports, and more. And the entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It is that easy. It has safe and fast withdrawals. And it is currently operational in over 30 states and Canada. So download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. If you are a first time user, you can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to 100 bucks with the promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, Prize Picks will give you $100. If you deposit 50, Prize Picks will give you 50. So do not forget to enter the promo code locked on and sign up for instant deposit match up to $100. All right, once again, you are listening to the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast. This is your host, Rafael Barlow with Leaf Tulane. Leaf gave us his top seven, or sorry, top six guys. And now let's see who is number seven on Leaf's big board. Yeah, I'm, I think this is no shock to you, but maybe a shock to some others. I've got G.G. Jackson at number seven, and you see him on popular sites that just tankathon in the 20s, and I think it's a there's a pretty fat chance he's, he's remaining past 10. Um he, he had zero points against Tennessee and everyone's going to be scratching their head. And then um, in SEC play, like, oh man, against when he plays those athletes that are really good defensively, like why, why is he scoring zero points if he's a top 10 prospect to you? Well, you know, like that, that's a counting stat. You watch what he does at the age he's at, the size that, that's so coveted in the NBA. He, he runs like a deer. He's got broad shoulders and he's able to create space, shoot the ball with confidence, get out and transition, be athletic. Um, I'm just... I'm really impressed by his ability to use his physical traits against older people to still create in a, in a way using guile and physical traits in an equal, um, equal distribution. I think his ceiling is really high. There's going to be some growing pains, I think, as the youngest guy in this draft. But um, I'm just, I'm just uh, remaining impressed by the fact that he went to a small school and he's making the most of his opportunity by showing what he has in his toolbox and he'll continue to grow his repertoire throughout this season and in the pre-draft yeah i have gg top five and i did an entire like hour and a half long podcast with chucking darts and he wasn't on the same page as me he's a little bit more skeptical about gg but my main i guess support for why i have gg so high is if he reclassified or if he stayed in his normal class and was in high school this year and was in the 2025 NBA draft, I think he would be the number one pick. And then even though he had a a, a rough outing <laughs> where he was 0 for 8, I thought he showed all the flashes and everything I like about him in the game against Tennessee. He showed he's able to attack the rim off the dribble. He he knocked down a, a three late in the game. He had a clutch, uh, well, it was a clutch three, but then he had like a, a pull-up jumper off the dribble. I just thought that he showed all of his flashes against you know Kentucky team that's really not that good right now but I agree all right number eight who's number eight on your list uh, so eight through 11 I was really fighting myself on it and I think this could change game to game and that's where the bias comes in um, I, I have Keontae George at eight right now Anthony Black was there a couple hours before I made this so so those two are really close Keontae George um, at eight, though, it is heavily dependent on his shot creation and his is just pure scoring ability. Um, I, I think that Anthony Black may be more ready immediately to come in and uh, and play like a supporting Castro. I just think that the star power um, that could be is is more likely to take the path of Keontae George. Um, he he obviously is not uh, Baylor's not at the level that I thought they'd be. They're not at the level that they thought they'd be but he remains a bright spot. Him and Adam Flagler are playing well and shooting the rock really well. Um, he's, he was a real bright spot against TCU in a, in a game and Kansas state where they both lost in, in close ones. Um, the one thing I have questions about is, is, is his defensive intensity that he's shown recently something that's sustainable in the NBA? I don't know, but you're, you're not paying him to be the defensive guy or else you take case and Wallace or Anthony black. You, you want him to be your star scorer. You've likened him to Jordan Poole. I thought of him as, as someone similar to like Jamal Murray, almost, um, you know, the NBA is at the scoring peaks right now. Like the, the best te- offense from, let's see, what was it? 10 years ago was, is, would be like the eight, the best offense from 10 years ago. That was the best at that point ever at offensive rating would be the 18th rated offense today. So offense is at a premium right now. 
And uh, I think you're going to buy stock while you have it. Yeah. At Turquavion was my Jordan Poole comparison. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. right. That yeah. was right. I was, I was thinking, but uh, Jamal Murray is my comparison. That would be the, the, the comparison for, uh, for Keontae George. I think yeah. they play similarly. Yeah, that that's fair. Uh, yeah. Keontae is, I think he's, and I've mentioned it probably multiple times. I don't know if it's either here or, or the big board. I think some of the concerns that people had about him coming into the season, whether or not he was a playmaker and could he defend, I think he's done a good job of answering those questions. I think the jump shot is going to eventually start clicking. We've, sh- we've seen glimpses of what he can do, but I think he has helped himself with the passing. And I, I heard on the broadcast, he like leads the team in charges. And so for a guy that wasn't coming into the season known as a, a good defender, now it's kind of like the red flag people have for him leading the team in charges has, has I think helped him out. All right. Who's number nine. Is it, is it one of the, the DFW guards? Between uh, Anthony I got Black An- and Anthony, Casey, Casey yeah, Wallace? I got Anthony Black right there. Okay. Um, these these guys are all tied up in an 8 through 11. That's, that's, that's a pretty close race. Um, Anthony Black is someone that I was low on entering the year. And my my theory was that his half-court athleticism was deceptive. Like it was because, being overrated because I'd see all these highlights of him dunking in transition. I'm like, well, of course he can. He's 6'8". And he wasn't a good shooter coming in. He didn't have this reputation. And then I just saw how he impacted winning for, for Arkansas. Like this team's got uh, given a tough deck of cards because Trayvon Brazil goes out for the year with a torn ACL. Nick Smith's got a knee injury and he's been out. And Anthony Black w- was dealt that hand early on and, and showed his ability to take over a game in Maui and was really willing Arkansas to wins where they were, they didn't have great chemistry. They had good talent, but he was the connecting piece and the star at the same time. That was something that really impressed me. His defense is impressive. He's got great positional size. I buy him as a passer. I think his shooting is getting better to a point where at six, eight, that he can be a respectable shooter because his low release won't be bothered because he's that tall. And, and I think he can play the one, two and three defensively and, and maybe two of those three on offense um, and, and in the NBA. And, and he, I just, I really love people that have the intangibles that lead to winning with high ceilings um, and, and obviously a high floor with that same comparison in mind. So yeah, I, I, I've fallen in love with Anthony black and that may be a surprise to some that I have high, him higher than his teammate, Nick Smith. Yeah. We had talked about him. It wasn't before the season. It was probably after like maybe the first few games. And we both were like, see, I'm not as high on Anthony Black. I knew I was right. And then after I was Maui, right before the Creighton game. I remember this conversation yeah. very well. Actually, I think it was before the Louisville game. The oh, Louisville no, no, you're game. right. It was, it was, it was we, we knew the they were going to beat Louisville. So we, we yeah. I, at least I, I was going to play basketball and I was like, you know what? I'm going to turn this off. Like I, I saw seen enough and I was going to go watch on synergy. And then we started texting like, man, we're wrong. Yeah. Yeah. He's definitely uh, um, changed my thought. And I know on an article that I wrote and I wrote it based off of like what I like about each prospect. And the thing that I liked about Anthony black was that I was wrong about him. And I like him over like at the same time, I like him better than I like Dyson Daniels and Dyson Daniels went what seventh or eighth. I think eighth. eighth. And so um, Anthony black could easily go number eight. All right. At number 10, I guess we kind of hinted at it. Casey Wallace. Yeah, I've got Case and Wallace number ten, Nick Smith number eleven, and and once again eight through eleven is a toss-up. Case and Wallace, um, he's a guy that I think is is the a bright spot on a team with kind of a, a gloomy vibe about them. They just lost to South Carolina at Rupp Arena, but Case and Wallace has been consistent. He's shot the ball better than anyone had anticipated. I think his three point shooting will go down and his free throw percentage will go up, so it'll be kind of a regression of the mean in both aspects. Defensively, he's one of the best players in this draft. Regardless of position, he'll be an impact defender right away. He'll be able to knock down open shots. He'll be a contributing winning basketball player with an extremely high floor that whose ceiling is higher than people um, anticipated coming in. I think his well-roundedness is something that that people should value around this tenth pick. Like, what? How can he contribute to winning? As a Jazz fan, I'd be perfectly happy taking him around where the Jazz are picking. I think there's people that maybe looking for the swing for the fences and but but you've made this analogy all coaches want him uh the gms maybe looking to make a splash hit and and um maybe that's that's the guy that's why i have anthony black over case and wallace because i think he's got a little higher potential and he does a lot of similar things but i think case and wallace is the safer of those two i could see that i i could definitely see that i mean i think like if he ends up being 
Drew Holiday, like people believe he will be. And then what is, you know, your best case scenario for Anthony Black? I can see both both sides of the coin. All right, that wraps up your top 10. All right, when we return, we'll start at number 11. Let's talk about Bet Online because that is your number one source for betting, info, stats, news, and analysis. You can get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there from pro football to basketball. They got it all at betonline.net. If you love sports podcasts, you can even find those on BetOnline as well. It is the fastest and the easiest way to get your betting info. So head to the website today and use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online. It is where the game starts. All right. Last segment. So far, we've only been able to get 10 guys. Who's number 11 on your list? Number 11 is Nick Smith. And, and this is someone that has as much potential to move up in, in this order for me as anyone. But when I watched Arkansas, the guy who stood out on the tape was, was Anthony Black. And for Nick Smith, the way to make his, his case as being a top 10 pick is being someone dynamic with the ball in his hands. And when he had the ball in his hands, I, I didn't think he was particularly dynamic. I think he thrived more as someone off the ball who, was, who uh, according to Synergy, was just about as good as it gets us for a freshman shooting catch and shoots. And that's not exactly what I'm buying him to be. He doesn't blow by you to get to all the way to the rack. He's got good touch around the rim, shooting floaters and push shots. And, and as someone who, who doesn't have the speed to get to the rim per, uh, for myself, I love a good floater. Um, but, but that's not something I want in, in my lead guard that I'm taking in the top 10 of the draft. Um, so I, I, I'm a little lower on him and also the knee stuff. I tend not to be super into the injuries because like a guy like AJ Griffin for me was top five, top six, um, even though he had a lot of knee injuries coming in. I, I just think it's, uh, it's something to be wary of. So you don't believe in if you were a GM, you would pay much attention to the medicals. Uh, that's not exactly what I'm saying, but uh, yeah, I'm saying I'm for the big board, I'm, I'm, ba- <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm basing it off on the talent I'm seeing. I'll, I'll listen to the evaluations. If I, if, uh, if I'm were the GM, that, that matters a little more if I'm picking for a certain team. All right. How much have you factored in rust for Nick Smith? I mean, we're talking about a guy that has an, a knee injury that is only, I think he's only limited to five games, really three full games. He had one game we played like seven minutes or something like that. And then another game, the last game he played, he didn't complete it. So he really only have a three game sample size. And we're talking about a guy that missed the first five or six games. So are you factoring in any rust into why you have him at number 11? I think I've been a little bit overcritical of him. And th- this is something I meant to mention uh, before the, the podcast, that this is one I wasn't confident in where I had him. Uh, I was just going off what I've seen. And that's why I think he's got the most potential to move up of anyone in this top, in the lottery, I should say, just because he could show me something once he's fully healthy, if he's fully healthy, that I just hadn't seen. And the burst is there. And that's one of my main criticisms is he's lacked a burst. And for someone who, who's going to be a lead guard, who, who's good at getting to the rim, who's got puts this pressure by making floaters and making making defenders help and touches the paint and creates, um, that's something you need. So I'm being a little overly critical on him. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm aware of that. It's just hard for me to, when I watch the tape, be like, well, I got to rank him based on high school reputation over a guy like Anthony Black that I've flipped my switch on and been like, man, he's really impressed me, uh, contrary to what I had coming out of high school for him. All right, valid. That that is very valid. Number twelve. Who is number twelve on your list? This is the exact opposite of what we were just talking about being critical, and uh, this is I'm I'm being uh, kind of the uh, hypocritical in a sense. Uh, it is Derek Whitehead, uh, someone that I think has the skills and what the NBA covets for a positional size. I think he's a point guard trapped in playing the three right now, and he's starting to pick it up after an extremely rusty beginning. And uh, I think that Duke, while it has the glamour, the luxury, that, that the allure for him that recruited him there wasn't a great fit for his personnel style that he'll display at the NBA level. That said, it makes him uh, adapt and, and not be the man on a team, which he's done well in high school, but it's different at a college level. And because of his injury, he was slow adapting, but I'm seeing the translation. He's getting up on his jump shot a little better. And uh, I think the creation skills are something that have yet to be displayed, which is something I'm banking on for him to make the lottery pick worthwhile. 
So do you think he is a lead guard in the NBA? And if so, are there any concerns about his foot speed and ability to get to the rim? Because I know you mentioned a little bit with Nick Smith. So is there any concerns with Derek Whitehead if he is a primary? I, I do think they play differently. But that's a that's a good point that he, and I don't think his foot speed's ever going to be there. Like we talked about, or I brought up Anthony Black and my concern for his half court athleticism. My concern is there for Drake Whitehead. He's not an explosive athlete, but he's got to get back to being functional, um, where he wasn't in the early season as compared to high level college athletes. Um, I think he's good at creating in the sense that he can create for himself, taking advantage of, of smartly of like height advantages, size advantages, can shoot the ball, can put the ball in dribble. He's very well fat, uh, well, well oiled. He's, he's been well trained and he's multifaceted, but also he makes the smart decisions. He puts pressure on you by passing and being intelligent. I don't think his ceilings as high as most of the people I've said above. And I'm typically a the best player available, high ceilings guy before I talk about high floors, but he's someone I just don't see failing. Um, and at a certain point in the lottery, if you're picking 12, that's something I'm, I'm concerned about by some people taking swings for the fences in these franchises that are on the fringe of being able to compete if they get a few picks right. Um, and, and you know, that that's, that's depends the team. But I, I, I am bullish on Dariq Whitehead's development um, accelerating in the next couple of weeks and months for Duke. All right, number 13. And this is where the draft becomes interesting for me. So I've got I've got Jarese Walker number thirteen. I think that's the the last one. That's that's not terribly surprising. He's he's a a big body playing for Houston. He's got an NBA ready body as a freshman. I think he's got more to his tool bag than uh, toolbox than than most people have seen at Houston because they're such a good team. We talked about this early in the year with like a guy like Julian Phillips or um, or Dylan Mitchell, where they're kind of strapped down because they're playing on good teams and they don't know what their roles. Well, Derek White, I'm mean, not Derek White, Drace Walker has uh, excelled in his role and accepted it. And I think that's something that's valuable. And it's a, it's a luxury to have someone that's able to adapt to that role, excel at it and have more in the tool belt. And you showed it against Virginia where he was like, well, we need to score against this really good defense. You know what? I'll take that upon myself and also rebound at the high level. Um, so he's showing his ability to impact the game in multiple facets. Yeah, the I know he had a big game this past weekend. I think the skill set for me that has me so high on him is the passing. And I don't think he's really fully been able to showcase his court vision and his passing instincts. And to me, that is why I'm so high on him. I think if you take his passing away, I probably wouldn't be as high on him. All right, number 14, rounding out your lottery. Who is the last guy to make Leafs lottery? It is a guy that is not going to one of these high profile schools. He's, he's attending Pepperdine and that's Maxwell Lewis. Um, I've watched every shot he's taken this season. As I told you, I've been just grinding watching film and I, and I have a few thoughts where, man, this guy creates so much space. Like he gets to the rim, he puts pressure on the defense and he can pass. And yet he's the focal point. And so I, I kind of give a bump when someone's really taking the brunt of a defense's attention. And yet he's still able to get to his spots. I will say similar to Brandon Miller, there's this element of physicality. I think right now he lacks, but I believe in strength training in the NBA that like once he's around the rim in the NBA, he's going to be able to finish better and be stronger around there. He sometimes goes up weekly, but that's about the only criticism I, I truly have because he gets wherever he wants. He plays at his own pace. He can shoot the ball. He can put the ball on the floor. He can pass. Um, and, and I think he's got a skill set that's really coveted in positional size is a word I've used multiple times here. And right now, the he's he's kind of heliocentric at Pepperdine with good players on a, on a on a NBA team. He'll blend right in and really impact winning at a high level with upside to be someone that is one of your core building blocks. And despite his lack of physicality, which I think is probably more so on the defensive end, he's a very very good finisher at the rim. I know. At one point around this time last week, he was shooting like 75% at the rim or something like that. And I think it fell to 70. I haven't checked in the last couple of days, but I'm I'm high on him. I think that if you put him on a better team, I think his efficiency would even be higher. I mean, he's been efficient, like you said, despite the fact that he is the number one name on on like – you know, the, the the scouting report, he's the guy that you need to stop for Pepperdine, even though Pepperdine is not really, really good right now. 
but as the focal point of the offense, and there are some people who may say, well, the team isn't good and he's getting points when the game is decided. He's getting ghost points. Fair assessment. But from a eye test, for me, he has the goods. All right, I need you to do me a favor. We only got to your 14. Can you come back tomorrow and round out the rest of your, your first round or your, your top 30? Yeah, I can do that. I'm I'm always happy to share the big board and, and to give out my takes. All right. Sounds good. We will finish the rest out tomorrow. So I want to thank you, the listener, for making Locked on NBA Big Board your the Locked on NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. Now for your second listen, check out the game to game podcast because every moment, every type of performance, every result, locked on game to game covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. So follow the Game to Game podcast on the Locked On NBA Network. It is available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Once again, this is Rafael Barlow and Leaf Tulin. Leaf just dropped off his latest big board with the top 14, and then he will be back tomorrow with the, with the remaining first round and You know, we may be able to get in a few second round picks here and there. Thanks again for listening. And we are out.